thank you very much. Uh, also, I would like, uh, I, I don't know why Brent sort of gestured towards me when he was saying we don't sell any software. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about any software that we sell either, uh, but I will be talking about, unless you're an insurance company and you're moving to value-based payments, in which case I would love to talk to you. Uh, so if anyone from Cambia is here, let's talk. Uh, but yeah, instead, uh, this presentation is actually going to start around four or five years ago. I looked something like this. Uh, I used to go down to the Bay Bridge at my job at the time. Uh, and at the time, I was working at a software engineering company some of you have heard of. Uh, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. Uh, I had onboarded a couple of interns. I had onboarded a couple of new hires. And I was thinking, you know, I've pretty much got this mentorship down pat. I've got it under control. Then I joined a new team. We made an acquisition. I joined that acquisition team. Uh, and a friend of mine was responsible for mentoring three interns in a particular summer. So the intern horde came and we said, Brad, these are all yours, your responsibility. Uh, and in the process, he was really excellent about it. He like organized them into little teams and they all had like their own special strategies and they had, their, like, they had like code words and catchphrases that they were using. Uh, and it was really impressive what he was doing. And as someone who had done this before, I could tell that he was doing this really well. Uh, and so after the summer wound down, I was talking to him and I said, Brad, what'd you do? How did you make this happen so effectively? And what he sent me was he sent me pages upon pages of documents that he had put together to prepare for these people's onboarding. He sent to me one-on-one -on -one strategies, he sent to me onboarding strategies, he sent to me project plans. And these were all things that I had never seen before or used before. And it was kind of mind-blowing to me because I was very intuitive of my mentorship. I was patient, I could talk to people, and that was how I got by. But what this really showed to me is that good mentorship isn't an accident. It's something that we can operationalize such that anyone who's coming on board to our teams can be successful. And that's what this talk is going to be about today. This, this talk is called Developing DevOpsers, a Strategies for Effective Mentoring. Uh, my name is Jonathan Maltz. My Twitter handle is at MaltzJ. If you forget that, don't worry. It's in the bottom right of every single one of these slides. Uh, and also, I work for a company called Nuna. We'll talk more about all of that stuff later. But for now, let's start talking about mentorship. Uh, and for this presentation, I'm going to use a very particular definition of mentorship, which is I'm specifically going to be talking about mentorship as onboarding. So that first period of time when someone comes on board to your team, that first 13-ish weeks when they're getting up to speed, is what we're primarily going to be focused on. There's another sort of larger topic here on longer term mentorship. So once that person is on your team, maybe they've been around for six, 12 months, how can we hook them up with a more junior or a more senior staff member to help both of them learn from each other? A lot of the ideas will carry over between the two concepts, but I'm specifically gonna be focused on onboarding for now, mostly because we only have 30 minutes. And so first, let's talk about this idea of what do I mean when I talk about operationalizing mentoring? Uh, some random website that had a definition that I liked, it was not Merriam-Webster's dictionary, talked about operationalization as the process of statically defining variables into measurable factors. The process defines fuzzy concepts and allows them to be measured empirically or quantitatively. Or an easier way to think about this is that success stops being random. So once you've operationalized your process, for onboarding people, it stops being completely random about whether or not they are successful coming onto your team. It stops being a question of whether they happen to get that one super empathetic, super patient senior software engineer or senior, senior operations person who can teach them the ropes. It starts being something where anyone on your team can be an effective onboarding buddy, an onboarding mentor, and anyone who comes onto your team is effective as part of that process. And there's three pieces of this in my mind in order to be successful. The first is that when you have someone coming on board, you have an opinionated process about how they are coming on board. It's really hard to operationalize something if the processes were like, I don't know, we kind of do this bespoke thing differently for everyone. Uh, that doesn't work with our deployment strategies and it similarly does not work when we deploy humans onto our teams. The second piece is that you want to spend the time mentoring and onboarding someone as the process of building clear habits. And once you frame onboarding and mentoring this way, it starts to become something that you as a mentor can operationalize significantly better in how you teach and coach people. It's because if you think about teaching as this wishy-washy weird thing that people sometimes magically do, it's kind of hard to reproduce that. But if you know that as a mentor what you want to do is build habits, there's a simple process that we can follow. 
what we do is we see when our mentee performs an action that we want to reinforce, and we want to do that more, we celebrate them. We give them positive reinforcement. If they don't do something that we want to reinforce, we don't reinforce that. And if we repeat that process, we can be successful. The last piece is that you're going to need to spend time teaching skills. The skills piece of this is really important. Because oftentimes, sometimes we will have people that come onto our teams and we don't necessarily know what we want to teach them. We know, oh yeah, we want them to be successful. We want them to do good stuff. But we, don't have, we haven't defined what does good look like? What is the time that we want to spend with them? What do we want to teach them as part of that process? And as a mentor, once you define the skills that you want to teach it, you can spend time teaching those with every opportunity that comes up. And this all starts before arrival. And if you want to do one thing to make sure that your mentee is successful, you should have a written down plan for the first 90 days of your mentee's time. Now it's important, I highlighted written down here because it's really important that you write this down. Because what's gonna happen is, especially if it's your first time mentoring someone, they're gonna come on board and you're gonna say, oh my gosh, what the heck is happening? They have so many questions and I didn't realize that this person needed to do all of these things. And you're gonna, if you just like, Talk to someone one time and say, yeah, this is how we're going to mentor them. You're going to forget all of that by week two. If you write this down, it's a, tool for you. it's a tool so that past you can help out future you to be successful with the onboarding process. This also helps with a couple of other things. First, one of the great things and one of the scary things about new hires is that they are a completely blank slate. If someone's more experienced, they might be a bit less of a blank slate. They might come in with some opinions and some ideas about how things should be done. But especially if you're working with new grads or people fresh out of university or non-traditional backgrounds who are just getting into coding, they ha probably have no opinions. This is great because it means that you can just tell them that your team operates in some way and they will believe you. If you have been, <laughs> this is true. Uh, I, I don't know. I won't tell that story because my, my current mentee might see that and I don't want her to know all the Jedi mind tricks I've been using. Uh, <laughs> but no, if you've been fighting with your team for, for weeks and months in order to get them to write postmortems, and you're just on that cliff and there's that one guy, Bob, sorry to any Bobs in the room, Bob is like always being a jerk and is like, I don't want to know why I have to write postmortems, and you're sort of teetering on the edge of building that culture. If you have a new hire that comes on board and you just say, yeah, after every outage we write postmortems. Then when they have an outage, you'll say, oh yeah, it's, a, it's an outage, you should write a postmortem. And they'll just build that habit like that. There's no fighting, there's no questions, there's no none of that. That's just how your team works. Now, of course, you can't like totally lie to them. You can't be like, oh yeah, we write postmortems for all of our outages, and then have like seven outages where you don't write postmortems. And then they have their first outage when they're on call, and you're like, we should write a postmortem. They're like, no, we shouldn't. We didn't do that for the last seven, and you're lying to me. But if you're actually honest with the things that you're trying to reinforce, you can help build, up, build your new hire into the best version of your team. The other flip side of this is that if you're not intentional and opinionated with what you want to learn, your new hires are going to learn something. If, if you don't tell them that you write postmortems after every outage, they, they're going to learn that your team is on the fence about whether you should write postmortems. If you don't tell them how to write commit messages and what you expect from their commit messages, they're just going to do whatever anyone else on the team is doing. And so what that means is you can either be intentional and opinionated about what they're going to be learning and start to build, pro start to build habits and skills that turn them into the engineer that you want to become, the DevOps that you want them to become, or you can just leave it to random chance. And by spending a little bit of time up front, you can make sure that they don't get left to random chance and every mentor is able to help their mentees be the best possible version of themselves. So how do we do this? How do we get this plan for the first 90 days? How do we form that opinion? The first is something shockingly easy. Uh, it's that we write down a list of skills that we want them to acquire. It is amazing to me, and it will probably be amazing to you once you go back to your team, how few teams actually do this, how few people can say at the end of 90 days of someone coming on board to our team, this is what we want them to know, this is how we want them to behave, and this is how we want them to operate. You all know this. You all know that like Samantha is like a rock star, and she knows everything, and she's a joy to work with. And you know that Bob, Bob's a stick in the mud, and no one wants to work with Bob because he doesn't do the right things. So you have a definition of what these skills you want are, you just haven't codified them such that you can operationalize teaching them. And so what you, what you want to do is take one or two hours and literally write a list in Google Docs of what you want people to learn in their first 90 days. And this will take 
probably one of two forms. First, it's going to be all of the technical skills. This is actually something that came from the document that we wrote for our, we do a lot of Python web apps backed by uh, using Django. And these are the things we wanted people to learn. We want at the end of their first 90 days, they need to be able to write Python. Uh, they need to know how the heck Django works. They also need to be able to write tests, and they need to know that tests are expected of them. Now, for people who are coming on board to our team, if someone has five, six, 10 years of experience writing Python web apps, uh, I don't know if Django's even been around for 10 years, uh, but, if it had, but if someone comes on board and they have experience with this, good, all of these things, we just check them off immediately and we don't need to worry about teaching them. But for someone maybe who's coming from a boot camp, someone from a non-traditional background, someone who's just coming out of university, every mentor knows that part of their responsibilities is to be teaching these specific set of skills. And you can give this to any mentor along with links to suggested references and, may, and, allow the, and then give them the opportunity to be successful with their mentee. The other piece of this is a set of habits and skills surrounding non-technical things. So for example, there's probably a way that you want your team to communicate on code review. There's a way that you want to interact with your product managers, your project managers. How do you, what are the habits that you want your team to build up around how you use your task tracker? Uh, for me, this is like, I, I like tell my mentees all the time, like using Jira is really important. And so the first week, I like make sure that they're building the habit of moving their tickets through Jira so that this way they're a good teammate and their team lead doesn't need to harass them at the end of the sprint and say, what the heck is the status of your tickets? So all of these things are things which are written down and we, give to every, we can give to every mentor such that as part of onboarding a new mentee, they know what they are expected and need to be teaching that person. The next is, once we have that big list of skills, we can use that for every mentee. But what we need to do for each individual mentee is we then want to write down a coarser month-by-month -month plan of what we want them to accomplish. And so this will look something like this. This is something that I just made up. But say for our mentee's first month, we want them to get competent with our provisioning systems. So say that what we want to do is we're using Terraform. We say the first month, the most important thing is that they're really able to just like use our Terraform systems and operate them as effectively as possible. And as part of that, what we have is we have a list of major things to learn for every one of these months. And so what this means is as a mentor, you can cross-reference the list of skills with what's happening in each month to say, these are the habits that I should focus on building and the skills that I really want to focus on teaching my mentee in order to help them be successful. And oftentimes, this plan follows a pretty basic structure. The first is that first month is focusing on excellent and comfort in one particular area. So in the case I showed before, it's a lot of Terraform. It's getting excellent with Terraform. For us, it's oftentimes getting comfortable with one part of our code base, say maybe just the front end or maybe just the back end and a particular piece of that. So this way we can focus on building those core foundational habits that will spread across the rest of their time on our team. Then over time on month two, what we're going to start to focusing on is start to focus on is broadening that scope. So after the first month, they should be excellent in one area. And then what we want to do is we want to have them start to touch all of the, the different areas within that system and use those core foundational habits that we built up over the first month to be successful in other areas. And then lastly, in month three, what we're focusing on doing is rounding out those set of skills to make them a full and in, totally independent contributor on whatever system we're ramping them up on. And after this, there are tons of areas that they can go in, depending on their specific interests and skills and experience, they can start to branch out in a lot of directions. But for the first three months, this is generally the pattern that we're gonna follow to help make sure that people can be successful. So after that, we've got that big list of skills that we want them to accomplish over their first three months. Then what we have is we have a course month, unique month by month uh, strategy for them. And the last thing is what we wanna do is create a script for their first two weeks. <coughs> And so this script is going to be a tactical description of everything we want them to accomplish over the first two weeks. And oftentimes, this is going to focus on two things. First is it's going to focus on a breadth of tasks for what they're going to do. So what they'll do is if, they're, if we're getting them, if their first month is spent focused on one particular system, we're going to have, a, have them touch a lot of different areas in that system. So this way they can start to become self-sufficient as time goes on. The other piece of this is that we're going to focus on speed of feedback opportunities for them. 
This often means having really small tasks. We shoot for one to two days for a task to be completed for pretty much any task that's coming on board, that, for that they're doing when they come on board. And this is important because, again, remember, part of the idea with having this opinionated process is that you have clear habits that you want to be building within the people who are on your team. And so what this means is in order to build those habits, you need to be able to give them feed they need to do something, and then you need to be able to give them feedback. And if you're missing, if they take two weeks to ship their first change, then it's really hard to get them feedback before week two about how they're doing or what habits they should be changing. So this script in total looks like has a few things. First, it's gonna have those small tasks. Hopefully they're completed within a day, they should be completed with a day or within a day or two. And ideally, you as their mentor should know how to complete those tasks already. Like for these first two weeks, these tasks like do like they do not even need to like directly be related to any project that you are working on. The core thing is making sure you have those feedback opportunities and teaching them. And so if that means that they're doing work that isn't directly contributing to whatever your first and highest priority OKR is, that's fine. Because by investing early on, you're gonna make them more successful to do those things over the long game. The other piece in this script is that you wanna have all the sort of non-technical things involved. So get in touch with your, have coffee with your teammates, set up your 401k, uh, like read the documentation on how to set up your environment. I guess that's technical, but whatever. Uh, all of that stuff, you wanna have it all scripted and written down in whatever tool you're gonna to be using. So if your team uses Jira, they, these should be Jira tasks so that they can be easily copied over. If you use Google Docs, if you use Asana, if you use Pivotal, if you use notes on a whiteboard, whatever that form is, that should be the form that this, that this script is taking so that you can start to build the habit for your mentees of going to that place for saying, oh, what should I do next? If I have a question, I should go to the whiteboard or I should go into Asana and I should make sure to use that effectively. Uh, and the bonus round here is that if you have repeatable things, you can start to create exercises for them. Uh, so Code Labs, we have, something, uh, we have something that we call Tools Week, which is a series of exercises that we put people through in order to get them comfortable with their tools. Uh, we also have Django Week, which gets them comfortable with all the Django documentation. All of that is scripted and available, or as, and is given to every mentor, such that they can share it with their mentee and use that time, use that as tools to teach their mentee. So next, your mentee has arrived. I take a drink of water. <laughs> your goal here is to get them successful as soon as possible. And this can seem super daunting and overwhelming if you've done this before. But again, the rad thing is, if you've spent that time to write down that plan for the first 90 days, Past you has hooked it up. Like past you has told you everything that you need to do in order to make your mentee successful. And so what you can do is as your mentee starts to have questions or comments or concerns or anything, what you can do is you can continually use that plan as a reference for what they should be doing. And one of the big things, one of the most important things you can do as you're going through that plan with them is to have really, really, almost impossibly high standards for their first, especially for their first couple of weeks on the team. Uh, one of my favorite stories about this, I think, came from, it was an engineer at some, some big software company, but he talked about the fact that his first pull request got turned around like four times until it was like perfect. And it had all of the right formatting and it had all of the right variable names and everything about it was just like spot on. Uh, and this was really striking because I was like, one, that's awesome that that mentor was able to instill such high standards and build the skills and the habits of having those really high standards on the team. And the other piece of it was, it was striking to me that he said afterwards, every pull request that that, that, that mentee sent, it was perfect. Because they had set that expectation and they had sent that, set that bar and built those habits from their process that this is the, what we're gonna be expecting out of you from this. And so as a mentor, you want to make sure that you're having those high standards, especially early on, to make sure that your mentee falls into those good habits of having high standards themselves. Now the flip side of this is this can also feel really hard. Imagine that you show up somewhere and you're just like, oh gosh, it took me four days to get my first pull request shipped because I'd be like, I can never get my braces right. Uh, if you're someone that maybe has a lot of confidence, then that's awesome and you'll be able to fight through that. If you're someone that maybe doesn't feel like you belong or isn't confident about how much ability you have, this might be something that, is, that sort of beats you down. It makes you feel like you're not in the right place. So as a mentor, your job is to balance those high standards with making sure that your mentees are feeling successful as well. This can take the form of a lot of things. I'm a big fan of high fives, so I always make sure to be sitting next to, like physically next to my mentee, 
uh, and on our team we will like move desks around and just not tell facilities. Uh, sorry, any facilities people in the room. Uh, but we'll just like we'll like move we'll we'll just like pick up our laptops and move our desks next to we, next to whoever is new. So this way we can like give them a high five or be really accessible for any questions that they have. Uh, if your team's distributed, like Slack and emojis are your best friend here. Anytime your mentor, anytime your mentee does something really great, or anytime they do anything new, like first change that they push to production, like first incident that they resolve themselves, like that always gets a that always gets a Slack emoji with a lot of that always gets a Slack message with a whole bunch of tadas in it, because it helps them know one they're being successful, and two it helps them know to can start building those habits. Uh, I'm also a big fan of fist bumps for this. The other piece of this is to make sure that you're checking in frequently. Again, this is important. This is less important for people who are more senior and might have lots of confidence. But for people who are less familiar, less sure about their place on your team, if they can't figure something out, they're probably going to feel like they're dumb. And they're like, I should know this. Everyone else on our team knows how this Terraform thing works. And why the heck don't I understand it? And it's like, because it's really freaking hard to wrap your head around Terraform if you've never seen it before. And it's your job as, the, as their mentor to make sure that you're pulling those questions out of them such that they can be unblocked and be successful. So I like to have a, have a particular check-in strategy. Uh, for the first two to three weeks, I'm doing daily check-ins. Oftentimes, it's more than daily. So what that means is when I come in every day, I'm saying, do you have any questions? Is there anything I can help with? After stand-up, I'm checking in to say, hey, heard your status. If, they, uh, if I'm a little bit unsure on how they're doing, I'll say, hey, do you have any questions about anything? And then lastly, before I end the day, I'll say, hey, do you have any questions about anything before I leave? This is another reason small tasks are really useful, because it gives you a really great touch point to say, if you know a task should only take one to two days, and you don't see a code review, and you're not, you don't see progress towards a code review after maybe one and a half, two days, then you know, even if that person is telling you that everything's fine, it's time for you to start to be more proactive and checking in with them and saying, hey, how is this going? Next thing is, I'll schedule 45 minute one-on-ones with my mentee for the first 13 weeks. This is in addition to anything they're doing with their, their manager, especially if managers at your team are pure people managers. So if, you're man if managers on your team have six, eight, 10, maybe even 12 direct reports, there is no way that they are going to be giving hands-on technical coaching to the new, the new person that you're bringing onto your team. It needs to be the mentor's responsibility, again, especially for new grads and especially for people that are newer to the system, how they can do that effectively. Uh, and so you can also be referencing your list of skills for that. Uh, lastly, anytime I give them a new type of tasks, I, I make sure to check in every one to two hours. Uh, this is going to take a lot of your time. I am running short on time, so we will breeze through that slide. Last thing I wanted to talk about is how to handle any questions that come from your mentee. So as I call it, what happens when your mentee is like this kitten? Uh, I think of a four-step process here. The first is I want to figure out a path to the answer. So if someone asks me a question, I want to figure out not just the answer, but how do I know that answer so that I can give them every step along the way. The next step is I'm going to take a ranging shot. So I'm going to say, tell me how much you know about the database. Tell me how much you know about Terraform. Tell me what you know about AWS security groups. This is great because it helps me guide the set of skills that I can give them, what I can pull from that list that we wanted to deliver uh, for that particular thing. It also prevents you from being a jerk and like spending 20 minutes explaining something to someone that they already fully understand, uh, which can feel super, which makes you feel super silly as a mentor uh, and is just a waste of everyone's time. The next is you want to decide what they can learn. So you have that big list of skills, and you don't want to be overwhelming your mentee with all of those skills at, at one time. It can be too much for them to handle. So once you know where they're at, you can start asking them, uh, you can start to figure out which of that subset do I want to teach them. Then you want to walk them along the path to that answer. So you know all the steps that you took, you know the highlights that you want to give your mentee, and it's time to walk through them, walk them through that to get them there. Depending on where your mentee is, uh, it'll look, that'll look a little differently. So if someone's less familiar, chances are I'm going to be doing lots of hands-on coaching and training and sort of having them build habits directly by just typing out the commands again and by typing out the commands a bunch of times. So really what we're trying to build is those core habits rather than that higher level thinking. If someone is more familiar, then what I'm going to be doing is more Socratic coaching, more questioning, and starting to build those skills of problem solving and thinking about, oh, I, I want to build this habit of when I have a question, how do we resolve that? 
This is going to take a lot of time and it's going to be patient. You're going to, if this is your first time doing this, it will, you will need to explain so that your mentee will forget what an AWS security group is. They will forget where the Terraform code lives. Uh, it took you months and maybe even years to figure out all of this stuff. You can't expect your mentee to get it overnight, but by being strategic and making sure to reinforce those skills and habits, you can make, you can make sure that they are successful. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I am running low on time. I don't understand but the, why, but this GIF like always slays, uh, so I keep using it. Uh, they say that you should take three things home from a presentation. You, the, the, four, the first thing is I'm running out of time, uh, but uh, these slides are all online. Uh, first, have an opinionated process. Build good habits early on. Make sure to take time to answer your mentee's questions. Uh, lastly, these are all resources. If you look at my Twitter handle, again, it's in the bottom right. This slide deck is linked to there, and you can find all those. Uh, we are hiring. We do healthcare data stuff. If you're interested in civic tech, gov tech, if you're interested in helping to bring down cost of healthcare and make people have better quality of care, uh, come talk to me. Or if you're just interested in any of that stuff and you don't want a job with us, that's cool too. We're in San Francisco, and we're also we also have a remote infrastructure team. If you've worked in a distributed team before, so that's all I've got. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy lunch. Thank you so much.